Epistle 3 by Mark Laidlaw I hope this letter finds you well. I can hear your complaint already. Gordon Freeman, we have not heard from you in ages. Well, if you care to hear excuses, I have plenty. The greatest of them being, I've been in other dimensions and whatnot, unable to reach you by the usual means. This was the case until 18 months ago, when I experienced a critical change in my circumstances and was redeposited on these shores. In the time since, I have been able to think occasionally about how to best describe the intervening years, my years of silence. I do first apologize for the wait, and, that done, hasten to finally explain, albeit briefly, quickly, and in very little detail, events following those described in my previous game, referred to herewith as Episode 2. To begin with, as you may recall from the closing paragraphs of my previous missive, the death of Eli Vance shook us all. The resistance team was traumatized, unable to be sure how much of our plan might be compromised, and whether it made any sense to go on at all as we had intended. And yet, once Eli had been buried, we found the strength and courage to regroup. It was the strong belief of his brave daughter, the feisty Alex Vance, that we should continue on as her father had wished. We had the Antarctic coordinates, transmitted by Eli's longtime assistant, Dr. Judith Mossman, which we believe to mark the location of the lost luxury liner Borealis. Eli had felt strongly that the Borealis should be destroyed rather than allow it to fall into the hands of the Combine. Others on our team disagreed, believing that the Borealis might hold the secret to the revolution's success. Either way, the arguments were moot until we found the vessel. Therefore, immediately after the service for Dr. Vance, Alex and I boarded a seaplane and set off for the Antarctic. A much larger support team, mainly militia, was to follow by separate transport. It is still unclear to me exactly what brought down our little aircraft. The following hours spent traversing the frigid waste in a blizzard are also a jumbled blur, ill-remembered and poorly defined. The next thing I clearly recall is our final approach to the coordinates Dr. Mossman had provided, and where we expected to find the Borealis. What we found instead was a complex fortified installation, showing all hallmarks of sinister combine technology. It surrounded a large open field of ice. Of the Borealis itself, there was no sign, or not at first. But as we stealthily infiltrated the Combine installation, we noticed a recurrent, strangely coherent auroral effect, as of a vast hologram fading in and out of view. This bizarre phenomenon initially seemed an effect caused by an immense combine lensing system. Alex and I soon realized that what we were actually seeing was the luxury liner Borealis itself, phasing in and out of existence at the focus of the combine devices. The aliens had erected their compound to study and seize the ship wherever it materialized. What Dr. Mossman had provided were not coordinates for where the sub was located, but instead for where it was predicted to arrive. The liner was oscillating in and out of our reality. Its pulses were gradually steadying, but there was no guarantee it would settle into place for long, or at all. We determined that we must put ourselves into position to board it at the instant it became completely physical. At this point, we were briefly detained, not captured by the Combine, as we feared at first, but by minions of our former nemesis, the conniving and duplicitous Wallace Breen. Dr. Breen was not as we had last seen him, which is to say, he was not dead. At some point, the Combine had saved out an earlier version of his consciousness, and upon his physical demise, they had imprinted the backup personality into a biological blank resembling an enormous grub. The Breen Grub 
despite occupying a position of relative power in the combine hierarchy, seemed nervous and frightened of me in particular. Wallace did not know how his previous incarnation, the original Dr. Breen, had died. He knew only that I was responsible. Therefore, the grub treated us with great caution. Still, he soon confessed, never able to keep quiet for long, that he was himself a prisoner of the Combine. He took no pleasure from his current grotesque existence and pleaded with us to end his life. Alex believed that a quick death was more than Wallace Breen deserved, but for my part, I felt a modicum of pity and compassion. Out of Alex's sight, I might have done something to hasten the grub's demise before we proceeded. Not far from where we had been detained by Dr. Breen, we found Judith Mossman being held in a combine interrogation cell. Things were tense between Judith and Alex, as might be imagined. Alex blamed Judith for her father's death, news of which Judith was devastated to hear for the first time. Judith tried to convince Alex that she had been a double agent serving the resistance all along, doing only what Eli asked of her, even though she knew it meant she risked being seen by her peers, by all of us, as a traitor. I was convinced, Alex less so. But from a pragmatic point of view, we depended on Dr. Mossman. For along with the Borealis coordinates, she possessed resonance keys, which would be necessary to bring the liner fully into our plane of existence. We skirmished with Combine soldiers, protecting a Combine research post. Then Dr. Mossman attuned the Borealis to precisely the frequencies needed to bring it into brief coherence. In the short time available to us, we scrambled aboard the ship with an unknown number of Combine agents close behind. The ship cohered for only a short time, and then its oscillations resumed. It was too late for our own military support, which arrived and joined the Combine forces in battle just as we rebounded between universes, once again unmoored. What happened next is even harder to explain. Alex Vance, Dr. Mossman, and myself sought control of the ship, its power source, its control room, its navigation center. The liner's history proved non-linear. Years before, during the Combine invasion, various members of an earlier science team, working in the hole of a dry docked liner situated at the Aperture Science Enrichment Center in Lake Huron, had assembled what they called the bootstrap device. If it worked as intended, it would emit a field large enough to surround the ship. This field would then itself travel instantaneously to any chosen destination without having to cover the intervening space. There was no need for entry or exit portals or any other devices. It was entirely self-contained. Unfortunately, the device had never been tested. As the Combine pushed Earth into the Seven Hour War, the aliens seized control of our most important research facilities. The staff of the Borealis, with no other wish than to keep the ship out of combined hands, acted in desperation. They switched on the field and flung the Borealis toward the most distant destination they could target, Antarctica. What they did not realize was that the bootstrap device traveled in time as well as space. Nor was it limited to one time or one location. The Borealis and the moment of its activation were stretched across space and time between the nearly forgotten Lake Michigan of the Seven Hour War and the present day Antarctic. It was pulled taut as an elastic band, vibrating, except where at certain points along its length one could find still points, like the harmonic spots along a vibrating guitar string. One of these harmonics was where we boarded, but the string ran forward and back, in both time and space, and we were soon pulled in every direction ourselves. Time grew confused. Looking from the bridge, we could see the dry docks of Aperture Science at the moment of the teleportation, just as the Combine forces closed in from land, sea, and air. At the same time, we could see the Antarctic wastelands, 
where our friends were fighting to make their way to the Protean Borealis. And in addition, glimpses of other worlds, somewhere in the future perhaps, or even in the past. Alex grew convinced we were seeing one of the Combine's central staging areas for invading other worlds, such as our own. We meanwhile fought a running battle throughout the ship, pursued by Combine forces. We struggled to understand our situation and to agree on our course of action. Could we alter the course of the Borealis? Should we run it aground in the Antarctic, giving our peers the chance to study it? Should we destroy it with all hands aboard, our own included? It was impossible to hold a coherent thought, given the baffling and paradoxical time loops, which passed through the ship like bubbles. I felt I was going mad, that we all were, confronting myriad versions of ourselves, in that ship that was half ghost ship, half nightmare funhouse. What it came down to, at last, was a choice. Judith Mossman argued, reasonably, that we should save the Borealis and deliver it to the Resistance, that our intelligent peers might study and harness its power. But Alex reminded me she had sworn she would honor her father's demand that we destroy the ship. She hatched a plan to set the Borealis to self-destruct while riding it into the heart of the Combine's invasion nexus. Judith and Alex argued. Judith overpowered Alex and brought the Borealis a rear, preparing to shut off the bootstrap device and settle the ship on the ice. Then I heard a shot, and Judith fell. Alex had decided for all of us, or her weapon had. With Dr. Mossman dead, we were committed to the suicide plunge. Grimly, Alex and I armed the Borealis, creating a time-traveling missile, and steered it for the heart of the Combine's command center. At this point, as you will no doubt be unsurprised to hear, a certain sinister figure appeared in the form of that sneering trickster, the G-Man. For once, he appeared not to me, but to Alex Vance. Alex had not seen the cryptical school marm, no male equivalent, since childhood, but she recognized him instantly. Come along with me now. We've places to do and things to be, said the G-Man, and Alex acquiesced. She followed the strange gray man out of the Borealis, out of our reality. For me, there was no convenient door held open, only a snicker and a sideways glance. I was left alone, riding the weaponized luxury liner into the heart of a combine world. An immense light blazed. I caught a cosmic view of a brilliantly glittering Dyson sphere. The vastness of the combine's power, the futility of our struggle, blossomed briefly in my awareness. I saw everything. Mainly, I saw how the Borealis, our most powerful weapon, would register as less than a fizzling matchhead as it blew itself apart, and what remained of me would be even less than that. Just then, as you have surely already foreseen, the Vortigaunts parted their own checkered curtains of reality, reached in as they have on prior occasions, plucked me out, and set me aside. I barely got to see the fireworks begin. And here we are. I spoke of my return to the shore. It has been a circuitous path to lands I once knew, and surprising to see how much of the terrain has changed. Enough time has passed that few remember me, or what I was saying when last I spoke, or what precisely we hope to accomplish. At this point, the resistance will have failed or succeeded, no thanks to me. Old friends have been silenced or fallen by the wayside. I no longer know or recognize most members of the research team, though I believe the spirit of the rebellion still persists. I expect you know better than I the appropriate course of action, and I leave you to it. Expect no further correspondence from me regarding these matters. This is my final episode. Yours in infinite finality, Gordon Freeman. PhD.